This is other than in a world news tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and you are watching World News Tonight where we bring you the latest updates from around the planet. Starting off in our neighbouring India where at least 11 people were killed and 4 others are reported unconscious in an incident of gas leakage from a local factory unit in Punjab, Sudhiana on the 30th of April. Four more people who were taken ill are undergoing treatment at a hospital. The area has been sealed while a fire brigade and an ambulance have been deployed there. A 50-member team of the National Disaster Response Force has also reached the site. A government statement said that 11 persons are so far dead in the incident. Police said the casualties comprise five females and six males. Two boys aged 10 and 13 are among the 11 who died in the incident. Punjab Chief Minister Bhagwant Man said the police, a 50-member team from NDRF team and government officials have been pressed into action for rescue and are present at the spot. Mr. Man expressed grief over the incident and added that all possible help will be being provided. The district administration announced a 200,000 Indian rupee compensation each for the family of the deceased and a 50,000 Indian rupee each for those who were taken ill in the incident. Ludhiana Police Commissioner Mandeep Singh Sidhu earlier told reporters that the incident occurred in Jaspur area of Ludhiana in the morning. He added that the source of gas leakage and type of gas is yet to be ascertained. An NDRF official said it was yet to be found which gas caused the deaths. A district administration official said a team of NDRF which has reached here will ascertain the source and the type of gas. Now shifting the attention to the coronation of His Majesty the King Charles III, the historic Stone of Scone, the ancient coronation stone upon which monarchs in Britain have been crowned for centuries, has left Scotland for London under tight security ahead of the coronation of King Charles III later this week. One week away from the coronation of King Charles, a full display of pomp and pageantry. It's with joy that I bring this stone of destiny to this abbey. The Stone of Destiny, an ancient rock and sacred symbol of Scotland's monarchy, brought from Edinburgh to London, to be placed underneath the coronation chair Charles will sit on for the ceremony. British monarchs have been crowned on the 336-pound piece of sandstone for centuries. The historic relic left Scotland Friday, the first time it's been moved since 1996. Next week, King Charles will be coronated on it, just like his mother, Queen Elizabeth, was in 1953. And tonight, coronation fashion, a first look at the robes the king and queen consort will be wearing on the big day. Anticipation is building. I'm excited for the coronation. With London in full preparation mode, the procession band rehearsed today as royal family members released fresh images of themselves. Over in Turkey, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan claimed that the country's intelligence forces had killed the leader of ISIS in Syria as he vowed to continue the country's fight against terrorism. In a broadcast, Erdogan said Turkey's national intelligence organization has been tracking a man known as Abu al Hussein al Husseini al Kurshi for a long time. He added that the Turkey's fight against terrorism contributes to Europe's security, claiming that Europe is not aware of this or does not want to be aware of it. Al Kurshi was named ISIS leader after the death of his predecessor Abu al Hassan al Hashmi al Qureshi, who was killed last October by the Free Syrian Army in Syria. Little was known about al Kurshi, but at the time of his appointment, ISIS described him as an old fighter. 
Erdogan's announcement came after a recent absence from the public eye due to illness. President Erdogan appeared on video link on last Tuesday for the inauguration of the Akya nuclear power plant. Erdogan made his return to public stage for the first time in three days on Saturday at an aviation festival in Istanbul, where he rallied his supporters as he seeks to extend his 20-year stint in power. Now for the news on the conflict in Sudan, hundreds of thousands of Sudanese have fled Khartoum and Afar region to seek refuge in neighbouring countries amid ongoing deadly clashes between Sudan's army and the rival paramilitary group, the Rapid Support Forces. But the violence that grips the country is making it hard for them to leave. It's the start of a third devastating week in Sudan. According to the Ministry of Health, the power struggle between the rival factions has killed over 500 people and injured more than 4,000 so far. As foreign nations scrambled to evacuate their citizens, Port Sudan became the main evacuation hub for foreigners. Tens of thousands of Sudanese have also fled the country to escape the violence. Satellite images showed long bus convoys at the Egyptian border, while the UN reported some 75,000 people have been displaced by the fighting. Khartoum is starting to be empty. We no longer felt secure. People were breaking into homes. They would break and loot. There was destruction. Even shopping malls were targeted. So it's, it's not as safe as it used to be. The situation is very bad. We didn't expect it. Friday we were fine. Saturday it all broke. And from that day it was fire in the street, uh, fire in the houses, in the cars, and uh, after uh, two, three days from that, the RSF, they start to have shortage of uh, food, water, and uh, power, so they start to invade homes. Speaking to Saudi news channel Al Arabiya on Saturday, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the violence. There is no right to go on fighting for power when the country is falling apart. My appeal is for everything to be done to support an African-led initiative for peace in Sudan. The conflict has caused severe shortages in crucial basic supplies such as food or water, threatening to plunge the country further into turmoil. The UN World Food Programme warned the violence could descend Sudan further into hunger, in a country where 15 million people already rely on aid to stave off famine. Over in the Far East, reports have suggested that another Yun Kishida summit may come early this month. And this time it will be in Seoul as Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is reportedly planning the trip that follows South Korean President Yoon's visit to Tokyo in March as the two nations work on improving bilateral ties. Multiple Japanese media outlets over the weekend have reported that Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is planning to visit South Korea early this month, with the Asai Shimbo reporting the trip could come as early as May 7th to 8th. The visit reciprocates South Korean President Yoon suk yeols visit to Tokyo in March, which the two leaders define as a breakthrough in mending bilateral relations that have been strained over historical issues. Seoul's presidential office has made no official comment on the meeting. Being the first visit by a Japanese leader in over five years, it will also mark the resumption of regular reciprocal trips that were pledged during the last summit. In yet another back-to-back -back meeting in the same month, President Yoon is also poised to visit Hiroshima to attend the Group of Seven Summit as a guest from May 19 to 21st. The latest developments come as Seoul and Tokyo have been picking up momentum in their bilateral ties. Seoul has restored Japan to its wild list of preferential trading partners, with Tokyo also having started its own process to do the same. The move also comes as the two nations seek to ramp up trilateral cooperation with Washington against North Korea, which was specifically highlighted during President Yoon's state visit to the U.S., which wrapped up just this weekend. The upcoming G7 summit will likely see a three-way meeting between the leaders against its backdrop. Bilateral cooperation on defense and stabilizing the chief supply chain are likely to top the agenda. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. French President Emmanuel Macron faces more nationwide protests as he seeks to steer the country on a from a divisive pension law that has sparked anger, pan banishing and social unrest. Last month he signed a law to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64 despite months of strikes against the bill. 
49 minutes and three seconds, yet the whistles can hardly be heard. The battle is not over yet for the opponents of the French pension reform, who called on football fans to make some noise in opposition of Article 49.3. What was meant to be a grand gesture of defiance against the French president, who was present on game day to greet the players, instead fell flat. On Saturday, as fans gathered at the Stade de France for the final of the French Cup, unions greeted the public at the metro stops with plastic whistles and red cards. We're counting on you to make as much noise as possible at 49 minutes and three seconds. However, many fans on Saturday night were more interested in celebrating football than thinking about politics. It wasn't the night to continue protesting, it was a night of celebration. It has nothing to do with that. Sports is different from politics. Nevertheless, some express their solidarity with their protesters. I whistled because I care about the pension reform. So what to expect on the 1st of May, International Labour Day? Opponents of the controversial reform have called for people to come out and protest. We still don't want this pension reform and we'll continue the mobilization until the end. Will Monday be the movement's last stand or a new show of force? For the first time in 14 years, all French unions will march together. 300 protests are expected to take place across France, with French authorities predicting a turnout between 500,000 and 650,000 people. Still in Europe, Germany launched a new flat rate public transport ticket valid across the country, but the 49 euro price point has raised doubts about the pass's potential impact. Tooting the monthly pass as a revolution, policymakers hope it will bring some relief for consumers amid soaring inflation and encourage people to favour mass transit in the name of the environment. Train travellers take note. Germany is launching a monthly pass for 49 euros. It'll be valid from May the 1st on the entire network of local and regional public transportation. The pass is coming, and for some, this represents a halving of their monthly ticket. It's a big boost for consumers, and will cost 3 billion euros a year for the state and regions. It's a bet on making train travel more attractive. About 100 kilometers from Berlin, in Wittenberge, Users are thrilled, especially since daily trips can be complicated. Sometimes it's tricky. My connection is 20 minutes late, so you have to be flexible. I love trains, but it's always an adventure. You never know when you'll be home. In this small town in eastern Germany, repeated delays and the station undergoing renovation illustrate a nationwide problem, dilapidated infrastructure. The mayor of the town has been fighting for years to have his city better served. The privatization of the rail system is partly to blame, he says. We absolutely wanted the company to go public and for the railways to become profitable. But when it comes to infrastructure, it only works if the government contributes. The 49 euro monthly pass is therefore just a step towards making Germans like train travel more. Especially since Germany wants to double passenger traffic by 2030. Some lines will be able to be modernized quickly, but others will take more time. We need to increase capacity, but it will take us five to ten years to bring everything up to standard. The government has committed to spending over 100 billion euros by 2030 so that the rail revolution becomes a reality in Germany. Now for updates on the war in Ukraine, Ukraine says it is responsible for a massive fire and oil depot in the Russian-controlled Crimea. But this does not seem like the end of Ukraine's retaliation as it says it was only the beginning of their planned spring counteroffensive. Ukraine is preparing for a spring counteroffensive with Kyiv's defense minister Oleksiy Reznikov recently announcing that preparations for the counteroffensive are almost complete. On Sunday, a massive fire broke out an oil depot in Russian-controlled Crimea. Natalia Humenyuk, a spokesperson for the Ukrainian Army of Southern Command, said that the attack on oil depot was carried out by the Ukrainian military. She added that the destruction of the Russian military's fuel depot was one of the preparations for that large-scale counteroffensive that everyone is waiting for. However, Mark Galeotti, a Russia security expert from the UK, warned in a Sunday Times article on Saturday that while Ukraine may show confidence in its counteroffensive against Russia, it should be cautious because ammunition and supplies such as shells are running out faster than expected.
He also warned that Ukraine may face difficulties due to Russia's fortified defenses. Russia appears to have already fortified its defenses in preparations for any counteroffensive. Recently, satellite images have shown that the Russian military has built large fortresses and minefields in the southern region of Ukraine, which is expected to be the main target of Ukraine's counteroffensive. Breaking through Russia's defense network could be a daunting task for Ukraine. Returning from his trip to Washington, D.C. and Boston, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol arrived back in Seoul with many agreements being made with his American counterpart, which in a way could decide the future of both the world economy and the geopolitical landscape. Touching down in Seoul on Sunday afternoon, President Yoon suk yeol returned from his official U.S. visit with a number of agreements aimed at broadening and deepening the 70-year alliance. The most notable outcome was the Washington Declaration, a separate document he produced with Joe Biden following their summit. To address North Korea's growing nuclear threat, the declaration reaffirmed Washington's extended deterrence commitment to defending its ally. It also established a nuclear consultative group to provide Ho with more insights on how the U.S. plans and acts upon the use of nuclear weapons. Critics, however, say the consultative group may fall short of expectations, as U.S. officials say they do not consider the new body a form of nuclear sharing with the South, like its arrangement with NATO. On the economic front, Yun's biggest task was addressing concerns about America's industrial guardrails against China and tax credit policies hurting South Korean chip and automakers. Without immediate solutions, the two sides agree to mitigate uncertainty for the South Korean firms through close consultations in light of the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act. Calling himself South Korea's number one salesman, Yoon held a number of roundtables and business events, garnering some $5.9 billion in investment from U.S. firms including Netflix. Some 50 MOUs were signed among the over 120 corporate leaders who made up his business delegation, focusing on the high-tech and bio sectors, agreeing to join together across all crucial strategic technologies, from semiconductor supply chains to the research and development of quantum and space tech. Yoon and Biden established a National Security Council-level economic dialogue and reaffirmed their commitment to developing the Indo-Pacific economic framework. President Yoon also pushed to make South Korea a more active player in global governance. Mr. President, your principled leadership has helped bring us even closer together and has made Korea a global pivotal state. In his speech to Congress, the first in 10 years for a South Korean leader, and in his unprecedented lecture at Harvard Kennedy School, Yoon pledged South Korea as a past recipient of international support during and after the Korean War will stand up for freedom and liberal democracy around the world. Yoon's official state visit having set the blueprint for the bilateral alliance and expanding value-based friendship. The president's mission now is to turn his stateside pledges into tangible outcomes for the South Korean public. We have some good news for you. More people these days are enjoying life after retirement by operating small smart farms. These smart farms are not only easy to operate but also make considerable profit, opening the way for retirees to earn money while doing something they like. Ginseng sprouts grow in this 26 square meter greenhouse. It can be seen as a smaller version of a smart farm. Everything from temperature and humidity to water and liquid fertilizing is managed automatically. Music is also played to help the plants grow. The farmer has been retired for two years, but these small smart farms enable him to continue to earn money. It costs him around 1 billion won to operate 20 small smart farms. His monthly income is around 30 million won. With these small farms, I come for a bit and get done what I need to fairly easily, but my income has gone up considerably. This is a company in Gyeongsangnam-do province that manufactures small smart farms. It provides overall smart farm services such as manufacturing equipment, seedling supply, crop purchasing and distribution. Sales in 2019 were around 2.2 billion won and recorded 32 billion won last year. That's a 15-fold increase in just three years. It also means that more people are now operating small smart farms.
We get so many retirees, many actually retire early. They come to our smart farm after contemplating about what to do after retirement. The global smart farm market size last year was 482 trillion won. The South Korean market is predicted to grow to more than 5 trillion won by 2024. More people preparing for life after retirement are expected to increase their interest in small smart farms. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care of the world in a minute. Sergio Perez beat teammate and championship leader Max Verstappen to win the Azerbaijan Grand Prix and continue Red Bull's domination of the Formula 1 season. Charles Raquel followed 15 seconds behind the Red Bulls in third place, bringing the first podium for Scuderia Ferrari for the 2023 season. Hundreds of Cambodian workers rallied for better working conditions and higher pay at a May Day march in Cambodia's capital Phnom Penh, waving Cambodian flags, banners and chanting Long Live the Workers. The demonstrators marched around one of the city's major landmarks. Shortly after polling stations closed in Paraguay, early election counts showed ruling Colorado's party candidate Santiago Pena in lead. Pena led against center-left opposition rival Efrain Alagar by some 46% to 29% with a quarter of the votes tallied. Law enforcement officials continued their investigation of the scene of a deadly Texas shooting as the suspect remained on the loose. Officers from local and state police as well as the FBI combed the property where 38-year-old Francisco Presa lives. U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy met Israel counterpart Amir Ohana at the start of a two-day visit to Israel. During his visit, Republican McCarthy is scheduled to visit the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum and address the Knesset, Israel's parliament in Jerusalem. Bayern Munich struck twice in the second half to beat bottom club Hertha Berlin 2-0 and retake the lead in the Bundesliga with four matches remaining. The victory ended Bayern's four-game winless run across all competitions. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we will see two pairs of giant panda twins gathered around a table for a breakfast party in Zhongqing Zoo in southwest China, Zhongqing City, attracting many visitors during the ongoing Labor Day holidays. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your night.